أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode <coughs> we introduced the topic of the Isra and the Mi'raj and it is believed that the, the ascension of the Prophet in particular took place multiple times in the life of the Prophet and, a, and according to a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq the Prophet experienced 120 heavenly ascensions. Now it seems that the night journey of the Prophet, the Isra from Mecca to Jerusalem occurred only once. And this is mentioned in the Quran, Subhan al Asra bi Abdihi Laylan Min al Masjid al Harami il al Masjid al Aqsa al Ladi Barakna Hawla. This is mentioned in the first verse of Surah Al Isra. And we have no reason to believe that the Isra occurred more than once. Whereas the Mi'raj, the heavenly ascension of the Prophet, is believed to have happened multiple times because the, the birth story of Lady Fatima al-Zahra salam is related to the Prophet eating from the fruits of paradise which formed her life seed. We know that, and this was in the fifth year after, after the Bi'tha, which, is the, the, which coincides with the birth of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. And we know that Salah was not legislated until after the death of Khadija. So we know just from looking at the Hadith literature about the Isra and looking at the, the prophetic timeline in Mecca, we can very easily conclude that the Prophet indeed experienced multiple uh, heavenly ascensions. Now, last week we spoke about the Isra, the Prophet's night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. There are ahadith that mention that the Prophet stopped at multiple places on this journey. He stopped at certain sacred places to perform prayer, and these places include the holy city of Medina, which will eventually become the, the place where the Prophet emigrates to. The Prophet stops in Bethlehem, he stops at Mount Sinai, and eventually he arrives at uh, Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. So during this night journey, the Prophet sees certain things. Of course, these are he sees things with the eye of the heart. Because as we mentioned, everything that the Prophet sees during the Isra and the Mi'raj are things that only his soul has the capacity to witness. Meaning that if we were with the Prophet during the Isra and during the Mi'raj, chances are we would not be able to perceive these realities because we don't have the capacity to witness uh, such realities. So... The Prophet goes on this night journey. He stops in these sacred places to perform uh, prayer. And the creature that facilitates the, the Isra and the Mi'raj of the Prophet, we mentioned the Ahadith speak of Al-Buraq. And Al-Buraq comes from the word which means Barq. Now, this doesn't mean that we're talking about a, a literal winged horse. We have no idea what the nature of this, uh, this creature is. But we know that there was some type of uh, creation that facilitated this horizontal journey known as the Isra and then the vertical journey which is known as the Mi'raj. And when I say vertical journey, we don't mean in a spatial sense because as you traverse through those realms you're essentially uh, traveling through immaterial worlds so 
we have to bear this in mind when we read the literature on the Isra and the Mi'raj and oftentimes we cannot take these descriptions literal because we're speaking about a world, a non-physical world and realms which are beyond our comprehension. Now, continuing our conversation on the ahadith about the Mi'raj, we mentioned that as the Prophet ﷺ begins his journey, he, and this is mentioned by the way in the 18th volume of Biharul Anwar, beginning on page 320 onward. So the Prophet now is beginning his ascension. And he says, and the Prophet is narrating this, he says, ثُمَّ سَمِعْتُ صَوْتًا أَفْزَعَنِي As the Prophet begins his ascension, he says, I then heard a sound that frightened me. فَقَالَ لِي جِبْرَائِيل Jibrail said to me, Can you hear that? فَقَالَ لِي جِبْرَائِيل أَتَسْمَعُ يَا مُحَمَّدْ Are you hearing this, O Muhammad? قُلْتُ نَعَمْ I said, yes. Jibrail says to the Prophet that this sound that frightened you, that startled you, he says, هَذِهِ صَخْرَةٌ قَذَفْتُهَا عَنْ شَفِيرِ جَهَنَّمْ مُنْذُ سَبْعِينَ عَامًا فَهَذَا حِينَ استقرت. He says, that sound that you heard was from a rock which had been thrown into Jahannam 70 years ago. And that rock landed in the depths of hell and it settled. Now this tradition gives you an idea of the immensity of the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So you see that during the Mi'raj of the Prophet, he's being exposed to the reality of the hellfire and, and just you know the depths of it. And then the hadith continues. قَالُوا فَمَا ضَحِكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ حَتَّى قُبِضْ It is said that after the Prophet saw the hellfire and encountered it and witnessed it, it is said that from that time, from the time that the Prophet was experienced that, he was never seen to laugh as long as he was alive. Of course, the Prophet smiled, but the Prophet never laughed after encountering, after being exposed to the horrific scenes of Jahannam. قال فصعد جبرائيل The Prophet continues narrating and he says, We continued our trip our trip through the, the heavens. وَصَعَدْتُ مَعَهُ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا وَعَلَيْهَا مَلَكٌ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِسْمَاعِيلٌ So the journey of the Prophet, so that this entire journey, the Isra and the Mi'raj began from Mecca and the Prophet traveled through the night until he reached Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem from Masjid al-Aqsa, the journey through the heavens begins. And the first heaven, the first sky that they traverse through is Sama'ud dunya the earthly heaven, the earthly sky. And Sama'ud dunya is basically the universe as we know it. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحِ That we have decorated the lowest heaven with stars, with these celestial bodies. 
So this is where the so the prophet is now traveling through the lowest heaven. وَعَلَيْهَا مَلَكٌ يُقَالُ the, So the, the lowest heaven, or the, you know, the upper atmosphere of the earthly realm, if you want to call it that, they come across an angel whose name is Ismail. Of course, not to be confused with uh, the prophet Ismail. This is an angel. The narrations mention that his name is Ismail. وَهُوَ صَاحِبُ الْخَطْفَةِ الَّتِي قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِلَّا مَنْ خَطِفَ الْخَطْفَةَ فَأَتْبَعَهُ شِهَابٌ ثَاقِبٌ There is an angel at the border of the lowest heaven. And this angel acts as a guard. It's a custodian of that region. And this is where the jinn, according to the Qur'an, especially before the birth of the Prophet, jinn, they had access, they would travel to the border of Sama'ud Dunya in order to eavesdrop on the assembly of angels to collect information about what is going to happen with humankind in the future. So the angels would eavesdrop on the angelic realms. And this is what is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Safat. Some of them, meaning the, the jinn, who covertly steal words from the heavens are pursued by a glistening flame. So this area, they used to have access to it. They would, they would travel to this border and they would try to eavesdrop. Now, after the birth of the Prophet, this area was reinforced and basically they're blocked from eavesdropping and collecting information from the angelic world. So the angel that is guarding this area, that is the custodian of Sama'ud Dunya, which is basically the earthly heaven, Sama'ud Dunya and the second heaven, this is an angel called Ismail. So the hadith says, this angel known as Ismail, who resides in this region, under the supervision of the angel Ismail, is 70,000 angels. تَحْتَ كُلِّ مَلَكٍ سَبْعُونَ أَلْفَ مَلَكٍ Under the supervision of Ismail is 70,000 angels. And under the supervision of each of these angels is 70,000 other angels. So you can only imagine uh, the, the power and the authority of, of this angel. فَقَالَ يَا جِبْرَائِيلِ مَنْ هَذَا معك? The angel, whose name is Ismail, asks Jibra'il, Who is with you? Who is this person who is with you? فَقَالَ Jibra'il says, This is Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله. قَالْ وَقَدْ بُعِثْ Has he been sent to humankind? As a guide? قَالَ نَعَمْ Jibra'il says, yes, he has been sent. فَفَتَحَ الْبَابِ فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَيْهِ The door was open. It seems that they did not have direct access to him. They're given access. Rasulullah meets this angel. They exchange greetings. وَاسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُ The Prophet says, I asked Allah for his forgiveness. So they do istighfar for one another. وقال, and then this angel says to the Prophet, Welcome, O righteous brother, O righteous Prophet. 
وَتَلَقَّتْنِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ حَتَّى دَخَلْتُ السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا The Prophet says, Angels began to swarm me. They surrounded me. They, they began greeting me. Because the angel Ismail has all of these angels under his command. So they all come to greet the Prophet And the Prophet greets them until he enters into the, the realm of the heavenly, the, uh, the earthly heaven. So beyond dunya, you have sama'ud dunya, and then the, the heavens above it. فَمَا لَقِيَنِي مَلَكٌ إِلَّا ضَاحِكًا مُسْتَبْشِرًا The Prophet mentions that there was not a single angel that I met, except that that angel was cheerful, was smiling and cheerful. حَتَّى لَقِيَنِي مَلَكٌ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ لَمْ أَرَ أَعْظَمَ خَلْقًا مِنْ كَرِيهَ الْمَنْظَرِ ظَاهِرَ الْغَضَبِ The Prophet وآله, he says that I met the angel Ismail and I met all of the angels who were under his command. I was greeted by them. And this is all uh, in Sama'ud Dunya. And then the Prophet says that all of them were smiling and they were cheerful. And then I came across, I saw a great angel which was unlike anything that I have ever seen. I had not seen any creation. Lam ara a'azama khalqan min. I have not seen a creation that is more immense than this creature. Kariha al manzar. But this creature had a very unpleasant appearance. Wahir al ghadab. It was it was a creature, it was an angel that looked very stern. There were signs of wrath in the eyes of this angel. So the Prophet, again, you see all of these angels which are very delicate creatures, very graceful, very kind, very pleasant. And then among these angels, there is this massive, immense angel who is unpleasant, who looks angry and wrathful. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Man hadha ya Jibra'il? Who is this, O Jibra'il? فَإِنِّي قَدْ فَزِعْتُ مِنْ Because I feel frightened from this angel. فَقَالَ يَجُوزُ أَنْ تَفْزَعَ مِنْ وَكُلُّنَا نَفْزَعُ مِنْ Jibra'il says to the Prophet that that don't feel don't feel surprised that you are frightened from him you are allowed you're permitted to be frightened of from him because we are all in awe of him we feel this fear from him inna hadha malikun khazinun nar this angel that has filled your heart with fear is the angel Malik who is the keeper of the hellfire. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us. Lam yadhak qat Until now, he has never smiled. Allah created this angel to be the custodian, to be the guard, to be the keeper of Jahannam. وَلَمْ يَزَلْ مُنْذُ وَاللَّهُ اللَّهُ جَهَنَّمْ يَزْدَادُ كُلَّ, يوم كل يَوْمٍ غَضَبًا وَغَيْضًا عَلَىٰ أَعْدَاءِ اللَّهِ وَأَهْلِ مَعْصِيَتِهِ Every day, his anger towards the enemies of God and those who commit sins increases. And it is through this angel that Allah Azza wa Jal will punish uh, the sinners, those who don't. Repent. فَيَنْتَقِمُ اللَّهُ بِهِ مِنْهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish 
his enemies through him. وَلَوْ ضَحِكَ إِلَىٰ أَحَدٍ كَانَ قَبْلَكَ أَوْ كَانَ ضَاحِكًا إِلَىٰ أَحَدٍ بَعْدَكَ لَا ضَحِكَ إِلَيْكَ Ya Rasulullah, Jibra'il is basically telling the, telling the Prophet that don't take it personally, that he doesn't smile at you. If he were to smile to anyone before you or after you, if he was permitted, if he had the ability to smile, he would have indeed smiled in your face. But he does not smile. How can he smile? He is the, the keeper of hellfire. The Prophet he says, I sent salam to him. I greeted to him. Malik, the angel of the hellfire, reciprocated my salam. وَبَشَّرَنِي بِالْجَنَّةِ And he gave me the glad tidings of paradise. Basically that, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry, this is not, this is not a place for you or those who follow you. And then the Prophet ﷺ, according to this narration, he asks to see hellfire. So he meets the angel of Jahannam. He meets Malik, who is the keeper of hell. But the Prophet asks Jibra'il, can you ask him to show me the fire of hell? فَقَالَ لَهُ جبرائيل يا مالك أرى محمد النار أرى محمد النار show Muhammad show the Prophet the fire of hell the hadith says فكشف عنها غطاءها مالك he uncovered the fire of hell وَفَتَحَ بَابًا مِنْهَا And he opened one of the gates of hell. We, from the ahadith we know that the gates to Jannah are eight. And the gates to Jahannam are seven. And scholars mention that this is an indication that there are more paths to paradise, then paths to hellfire. And this is also one of the signs of Allah's rahmah. There are more ways of entering Jannah than Jahannam. In any case, the Prophet, the, the Prophet he asks to see hellfire. Malik, he lifts the veil, he uncovers it, he opens one of its gates. فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا لَهَبٌ one flame from Jahannam jumps out and it's a flame that it, it's, it shot up into the sky. It was a raging flame. وفارت. The flames were raging and boiling. وارتفعت. حتى ظننت لتتناولني مما رأيت. The Prophet said that the flames were so fierce and they were raging that Rasulullah felt that the, the flame would engulf him, that it would touch him. فَقُلْتُ يَا جُبْرَائِيلُ قُلْ لَهُ فَلْيَرِدْ عَلَيْهَا غِطَاءَهَا When the Prophet saw that flame leaping, from the hellfire, the Prophet said, O Jibra'il, tell Malik to, to cover up Jahannam. Fa'amaraha, Malik commanded hellfire to close. Fa'kullaha, arji'i, faraj'at ila makaniha alladhi kharajat min. So then Malik essentially closed the doors of hell. Now, one question that people often ask is, do, does hell exist now or is it something that will be created in the future? 
Now it's and this is a discussion between theologians, and it seems that Jannah, both paradise and hellfire, exist now. It's not that they will be created. In fact, we at this at every at this very moment we are creating either paradise or hellfire. In fact, at this moment, to a certain degree, we are experiencing either Jannah or Jahannam. But we don't perceive it yet. And this is why Allah in the Quran, He says, وَإِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ لَمُحِيطَةٌ بِالْكَافِرِينَ Verily, hellfire is encircling the kafirin, the disbelievers, meaning that they are surrounded by it. They're in it now, but they don't perceive. So, according to theologians, hellfire and paradise exist now. In fact, everything that we're doing is either creating a paradisal reality or a a hellish reality for ourselves. But we will be more attuned to that reality in the hereafter. The hadith of the Mi'raj continues. ثُمَّ مَضَيْتْ فَرَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا آدَمًا جَسِيمًا The Prophet says, I continued along. On the way, we met a strong, muscular man. And the Prophet asked, من هذا يا جبرائي? Who is this? فقال هذا أبوك آدم Jibra'il says that this is your father, Adam, Prophet Adam عليه السلام. فإذا هو يعرض عليه ذرية Adam introduced his children to the Prophet. فيقول روح طيب وريح طيب من جسد طيب. When Adam عليه السلام met the Prophet, he commented that a pleasing aroma is coming from your pure body. That you know, even in the Mi'raj, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله, the the pleasant aroma of his body was was emanating. And the Prophet ﷺ, he recites uh, this verse, these verses from Surah Al-Mutaffifin, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Kalla inna kitab al-abrari lafi aliyin, wa ma adraka ma aliyun kitab al-marqum yashhadu al-muqarrabun inna al-abrar lafi naim ala al-araik yanzurun ta'rif fi wujuhihim nadra al-naim." يسقون من رحيق مختوم ختامه مسك وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون ومزاجه من تسنيم عين يشرب بها المقربون. The Prophet recites this ayah of the Quran, and of course, this is the Prophet's way of responding to that compliment from Adam عليه السلام. And the Prophet is essentially saying that you know this is all from the grace of Allah. That I that I have this pleasant uh, aroma. So the Prophet recites, however, the records of the deeds of the virtuous will be will, will certainly be in Illiyin. With that, you knew what Illiyin is. It is a comprehensively written book of records. The ones nearest to God will bring it to public. The virtuous will live in bliss, reclining on couches, reviewing the bounties given to them. You can trace on their faces the joy of their bliss. They will be given pure wine out of sealed containers which have the fragrance of musk. And the ayah uh, continues. So the Prophet says, فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَىٰ أَبِي آدَم So the Prophet, he greets Adam وَسَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِ And he also greeted the Prophet, وَاسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَهُ Rasulullah says, I asked for his forgiveness. Now keep in mind that these Prophets are ma'asum. So when a Prophet says that I will ask Allah to forgive you, that doesn't imply that 
This is a forgiveness for any sin. Rather, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them for their inability to worship Allah as He deserves to be worshipped. And this is the reason why prophets, they do istighfar. They either do istighfar on behalf of their people or they ask Allah to forgive them because nothing that they do can compensate for the countless blessings that Allah has bestowed upon them. So they naturally feel that they have fallen short in expressing their gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet says, I greeted Adam and I prayed for his forgiveness. He too greeted me and he prayed for my forgiveness. And he said, وَقَالَ So Adam says, مَرْحَبًا بِالْإِبْنِ الصَّالِحِ Welcome, O Prophet and O righteous offspring. You know, so Adam refers to Rasulullah as al ibn salih you know, my righteous son. Wal Nabi salih and the righteous Prophet. Wal Mabuuth fi zaman salih and the one who was sent at a righteous time, the best time, and of course. It's the hikmah of Allah, it's the wisdom of Allah that, the, that Allah reserved the Prophet to be sent at the most appropriate time for the message to, to, uh, to, to propagate and to be amplified uh, around the world. ثُمَّ <laughs> وَإِذَا جَمِيعُ الدُّنْيَا بَيْنَ رُكْبَتَيْ The Prophet says, Then we came and we passed and passed by an angel among the angels who was sitting down and the entire dunya, the entire world was between his knees. So this you know, gives you an idea of how the size of this angel. You know, sometimes we think malaika are the size of human beings. You know, angels can take different forms. They can come in the form of human beings. But one angel is greater than the entire world and everything in it. So you can imagine the image and the appearance, you know, the, the, the appearance of Jibra'il in his natural form. You know, Malakul Mawt, Israfil, Mikail. So the immensity of these angels is something that is, is quite uh, remarkable. وَإِذَا جَمِيعُ الدُّنْيَا بَيْنَ رُكْبَتَيْ وَإِذَا بِيَدْهِ لَوْحٌ مِنْ نُور This angel who's sitting and the entire world, the entire dunya is between his knees. And in his hand there is a tablet, a tablet of light. وَإِذَا بِيَدِهِ لَوْحٌ مِنْ نُورٍ Now when I say tablet, of course, I'm not talking about, you know, iPads or some tablet. We don't know what the reality of this is, but this is the closest word that can express this reality. سَطْرٌ فِيهِ مَكْتُوبٌ فِيهِ كِتَابٌ يَنْظُرُ فِيهِ لَا يَلْتَفِتُ يَمِينًا وَلَا شِمَالًا مُقْبِلًا عَلَيْهِ كَهَيْئَةِ الْحَزِينَ This angel is looking at what is written on this tablet of light with sadness and gloom on his face. He doesn't pay attention to anything around him. He is fixated on this tablet. So the Prophet he says, فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَذَا يَا جِبْرَائِيلِ who, who is this, O Jibra'il? فَقَالْ هَذَا مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ Jibra'il says to the Prophet that this angel who is sitting and looking at his palm, looking at this tablet that is in his palm, this is the angel of death. This is Israel. Da'ibun fi qabd al He is always busy 
taking the souls of people. فقلت يا جبرائيل ادنني من حتى أكلم رسول الله says O Jibra'il take me close to him because I want to speak to him رسول الله wants to speak to ملك الموت فأدناني and I'm by the way I'm reading these riwayat verbatim from uh, Bihar al-Anwar which is these are narrations uh, reported to us by the imams of Ahlul Bayt فَأَدْنَانِي مِنْ فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet sends his salam to him. وَقَالَ لَهُ جِبْرَائِيلِ Jibra'il says to Malaku al-Mawt, هَذَا Muhammad, That this is Muhammad ibn Abdullah who has approached you. نَبِيُّ الرَّحْمَ He is the Prophet of Rahma. He is the Prophet of Mercy. الَّذِي أَرْسَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَى الْعِبَادِ this is the Prophet who has been sent by Allah to his servants. فَرَحَّبَ وَحَيَّانِي بِالسَّلَامِ Malakul Mawt greeted him, he welcomed him. And then Malakul Mawt says, وَقَالَ أَبْشُرْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ فَإِنِّي أَرَى الْخَيْرَ كُلَّهُ فِي أُمَّتِكَ O Muhammad, have the glad tidings because I see nothing but good for the future of your ummah. Now this doesn't mean that everyone in the ummah is good, but rather there is khair, there is great khair in your ummah. And even, you know, the word ummah does not necessarily mean the entire nation. It could mean a handful of people. You know, just like in the Quran, when Musa arrives in Median, and he sees that the, a group of shepherds. What does Allah say? فَلَمَّا وَرَدَ مَا أَمَدْيًا وَجَدَ عَلَيْهِ أُمَّةً مِنَ النَّاسِ Allah says there was an ummah around the well. But how many people do you think there were? 500,000 people or maybe 10, 15, 20 shepherds. So when Malakul Al-Mawt says that I see goodness in your ummah. It doesn't mean that, you know, I see khair in, you know, 1.5 billion. You know, some Muslims are wicked. Some of them are tyrants. Some of them are oppressive. But even if there are a handful of them who are mu'mineen, it makes sense to say that I see a lot of good in your ummah. Because ummah could even refer to a small number. But this shows you the value of Righteous people, even if they are small in number, Allah can, considers them a nation in their influence, in their impact. Ibrahim was one person. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan. Allah says Ibrahim, as an individual, was an ummah. He was a nation of goodness. So, Malakul Maut says, Abshir ya Muhammad. فَإِنِّي أَرَى الْخَيْرَ كُلَّهُ فِي أُمَّتِكَ I see all goodness in your ummah. فَقُلْتُ The Prophet says, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الْمَنَّانِ ذِي النِّعَمِ عَلَىٰ عِبَادِ Praise be to Allah, the giver of blessings, the one who has bestowed favors upon his servants. ذَلِكَ مِنْ فَضْلِ رَبِّي Look at the humility of the Prophet. He doesn't take credit for anything. He says that this is all from the grace of Allah and His mercy upon me. فَقَالَ جِبْرَائِيل Jibra'il says to the Prophet, هُوَ أَشَدُّ الْمَلَائِكَةِ عَمَلًا You know, all malaika they work hard. But Jibra'il says that among the angels, مَلَكُ الموت is the most diligent. He is أَشَدُّ الْمَلَائِكَةِ عَمَلًا there is no angel that works harder than Malakul Maut. Fakultu, and this is why, you know, some ulama, there was a great scholar who had the habit of sending salam. You know, whenever he heard the name of Israel, he would say salamullahi alayh. You know, in the same way we say this about prophets and imams, we say salamullahi alayhim. This alim, whenever he would hear Malakul Maut 
Every day he would send salam to Malakul Maut. Whenever he would hear the angel of death, he would say, Salamullah alayhi, may, uh, may God's peace be upon him. Why? Because this is a great angel who was always working for the sake of Allah. So diligent in discharging the tasks that Allah has given him. And this angel is the one who is going to facilitate our transfer from alam dunya to alam al-akhirah. This is a great, an angel that has a great responsibility. So we want to develop a relationship with this angel, to send salam to him. So Jibra'il says, this is the most diligent of angels. فَقُلْتُ The Prophet says, أَكُلَّ مَنْ مَاتَ أَوْ هُوَ مَيُّتٌ فِي مَا بَعْدَ هَذَا يَقْبِلُ رُوحًا the, the Prophet says, is it that any person who died or will die, his soul is taken by, by this angel, by Israel? Jibra'il says, Naam, yes, Israel is responsible for taking the soul of all people without exception. قُلْتُ وَتَرَاهُمْ حَيْثُ كَانُوا وَتَشْهَدُهُمْ بِنَفْسِكْ The Prophet asks Malakul Maut, Do you see every single person whose soul you take? Or is it some process where you're removed from the people? Do you see each and every human being when you, when you take their soul? Malakul Maut says, yes. And Malakul Maut says, O Muhammad, ma dunya kulluha indi fi ma sakharaha Allahu li wa makkanani alayha illa kadirham fi kaffir rajul yuqallibuhu kayfa yasha. Malakul Maut says to the Prophet that yes, I see every single person when I take their soul. And Malakul Maut says that Allah has given me authority. He has made the dunya subservient to me. And He has given me authority over it. And the entire dunya, the whole world and everything in it is like a coin that is in the hand of a person. And they can turn it around as they wish. This is how much authority Allah has given to Malakul Maut. And then, so the entire dunya is just like a coin in his hand. وَمَا مِن دَارٍ إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَتَصَفَّحُهُ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ خَمْسَ مَرَّاتٍ Not only that, Malakul Maut says, there is not a single house which I do not visit Five times a day. Malakul Maut says, Every house on earth, I visit it five times a day. Now, in another hadith, the Prophet says, Someone asks the Prophet, You know, why does Malakul Maut visit the household five times a day? And when? When does he come? The Prophet says, At the times of Salah. So Malakul Maut, on the day that he takes our souls, he's actually quite familiar with us. We are not strangers to him when he seizes our souls. He knows us very well. He, he remembers all of the days in which he would come at the time of Salah and we're negligent, we're heedless, we're abusing people, we're harsh with our words, harsh with our families. So Malakul Maut knows us. He knows who he's dealing with. And we want the day of our death to be a day that he looks forward to seeing us. That he, he has respect for us because he saw that we lived honorable lives. We don't want Malakul Maut to despise us because of our dhulm, because of our oppression towards others and towards ourselves. And then Malakul Maut says, and we'll conclude here inshallah, Malakul Maut says, وأقول, he says, I visit every house 
five times a day. وَأَقُولُ إِذَا بَكَى أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ, أهل البيت عَلَى مي على مَيِّتِهِمْ لَا تَبْكُوا عَلَيْ فَإِنَّ لِي فِيكُمْ عَوْدَ وَعَوْدَ حَتَّى لَا يَبْقَى مِنْكُمْ أَحَدْ ملك الموت says I say to the people in every house especially when I see them crying over the loss of a loved one, I say to them, don't cry too much because I will be back. I will continuously come and go from your house until the time comes when not a single person will remain there. Meaning, Malakul Mot, his job is to transfer all human beings from alam dunya to alam al-akhir. And eventually every single person is going to experience this, this transfer. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Every soul will experience death. And death is essentially this movement from one world to another which is facilitated by malakul maut. So this is the beginning of the, the Prophet's heavenly ascension. And as the Prophet goes further and further into the heavenly realms. He meets other prophets. He encounters uh, uh, some amazing uh, things. And inshallah, we'll discuss that in more detail in our next episode. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. And I look forward to having you join us uh, on another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any questions or comments? So, <clears throat> some scholars have said that this refers to meteorites. Now, this doesn't mean that the only function of a meteorite is to deter jinn from listening to the what's being spoken in the assemblies of the, the higher heavens. We know from the Mufassirin have said that earthly phenomenons like meteorites can serve can serve two per they can serve more than one purpose they can serve their natural purpose in creation and they can also have a spiritual impact so it could be that uh, that these meteorites serve uh, they serve they fulfill their their natural function in creation, in the physical sense, in the physical creation, but they also serve this other purpose. And they act as a deterrent, and it, and it basically prevents uh, these angels, these, uh, these jinn, from, uh, from eavesdropping and listening to the angels who are conversing with one another in that realm that is just that's at the boundary of Sama'ud Dunya. Now, prior to the birth of the Prophet, we know that meteorites existed. But after the birth of the Prophet, it seems that these meteorites served an additional purpose, in a, which is they started to act as uh, deterrence against. The jinn. Prior to that, for whatever reason, they weren't deterrents. But after that, according to uh, the narrations, that the the boundary of the uh, of sama'ud dunya 
was fortified by angels who basically prevent uh, those evil uh, jinn from gathering uh, information about from from the unseen worlds because in because what would happen is that these these jinn these wicked jinn because we know jinns can be pious and they can also be corrupt so these corrupt jinns what they would do is they would collect bits of information about the divine plan for humankind and they would use this information to you know uh, plan and to plot against uh, the truth and in some cases they may even inspire corrupt human beings to do certain things that could create obstacles for uh, for Haq and the people of Haq so this is what is meant by so Shihab and Thaqib as the verse mentions it seems they refer to comets or meteorites now I don't want anyone to Assume that, oh, the Qur'an is saying that the only function for these meteorites is that they deter jinn from listening to the, the conversations of the angels. That's not what we're saying, that they, that they serve a, a physical, they serve uh, their function in the world of creation, but they also have this, this metaphysical, uh, this metaphysical uh, function in uh, preventing corrupt jinn from collecting information from those higher those higher worlds does that make sense no it existed it existed before the birth of the prophet but for whatever reason those those meteorites were not being used to shoot down or to deter jinn its function as a deterrent only happened after the prophet now how did that happen what is what are the details we don't know but we know that after the birth of the prophet those uh, that area was fortified and one of the ways in which jinn are deterred is through these uh, these these meteorites. Now, jinn are, are also they're, they're fluid beings. It seems that they they easily move between uh, the physical and the uh, the uh, the metaphysical, meaning that they can take different forms. What we don't know how it deters them, but this is what we find in hadith uh, literature that before the birth of the prophet meteorites existed we know that from from science but they were still able to access those higher worlds after the birth of the prophet they saw that it was fortified by angels they were no longer given access they could no longer sit at the border of samaud dunya and listen they would be uh, shot down by these, these meteorites. So you have this physical phenomenon serving more than one purpose, serving its natural purpose in creation. And in addition to that, the angels, because we know the angels also, they control these natural uh, processes. So they were able to use that as a, way, uh, as a deterrent. Preventing the jinn from from eavesdropping. Of course, there's gonna there's there's ikhtilaf about you know what what that meaning what the meaning of it is. Some some have argued that this shihab and thaqib is not something that's visible it's it's something that is in the, the metaphysical world that they're shot down by something but it's not it's not meteorites so some have said that this is not a this is not a reference to uh, 
a physical phenomenon, but rather shihabun thaqib is something that exists in alamul ghayb and it's deterring uh, the jinn. So there's ikhtilaf, but it seems that the stronger opinion is, is what I mentioned, that you have uh, these meteorites, this physical process, these physical phenomenons serving uh, a double purpose at least. I mean, if, do you want my honest answer or do you want my, my diplomatic answer? My honest answer is, unfortunately, I think a lot of speakers even, I'm not saying scholars, but speakers, maybe they're ju they just didn't uh, study this area of, of uh, the Prophet's biography in, in up de enough depth. Maybe they just didn't come up, they haven't read uh, the tradition from Imam al-Sadiq. So I, I think that it could just be uh, a lack of knowledge on the part of a lot of the speakers who, who cover this topic. So it's the the Sama'u dunya is the first heaven because if we have seven, the lowest is going to be the first. So the, the first heaven and Sama'u dunya seem to be synonymous because we have a Sama'atu Seb, the seven heavens, and and I I want to always emphasize that Sama does not equal Jannah. We're not talking about paradise. So in English, I'm, I'm very precise with the words that I use. When I speak about Jannah, I will use the word paradise. When I speak about heavens and those realms, I'm going to use the word heaven. Sama is heaven or sky. And the universe as we know it, you know, which is what, 93 billion light years wide, this, it seems to be, this seems to be a sliver of Sama'ud Dunya. Because it is Sama'ud Dunya. The lowest heaven is decorated by these stars and galaxies that we see. So the Prophet's Mi'raj begins here, and the six heavens that are beyond it are imperceptible to us. And in fact, much of Sama'ud Dunya is imperceptible to us. So, so again, Sama'ud Dunya, it seems that this is, it's synonymous with the first heaven, meaning the lowest heaven. And then the Prophet travels through these higher worlds. And again, when we say, you know, the Prophet is going up, we have to always remember that we're not speaking about this vertical journey as a spatial journey. Because in these higher worlds, you know, the concepts of, uh, of space are not the same as, as we understand, uh, you know, from our experience. So, so, these, so when we say the Prophet is ascending, it's not literally a vertical ascension. It's an ascension, to high, it's an ascension in terms of the status, the degrees of these worlds, meaning that the higher you ascend, the less limitations there are, the less restrictions there are. So in Sama'ud Dunya, you know, the material world has the most restrictions and limitations. As you ascend higher and higher, those limitations are lifted gradually, 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 until you reach the highest realms. And this is where, you know, the, the limitations are removed and removed and removed. And you, you essentially reach a, a level where it's, it's completely mujarrad. It's complete, it's immaterial. And, uh, and inshallah, we'll speak uh, more about this in our coming sessions.
it seems I mean, it seems that this this doorway again we don't mean like a literal door whatever this is this is a, a way of accessing it seems that this was the the jump the the transition from dunya to sama'ud dunya so you have the the world the dunya and then you have sama'ud dunya the the heaven the earth the heavenly earth or the lowest heaven so this so when he says the the door was opened this was a transition from dunya to sama'ud dunya because isra the isra of the prophet is a journey through dunya from one part of dunya to another part of dunya whereas the 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 journey f- from jerusalem upward is a journey from dunya to sama'ud dunya then second uh, to sama'ud dunya then the second heaven third heaven and then beyond Does that make sense? You know, when it comes to malaika, we have to keep in mind that they they seem to change their form depending on where they are. So, for example, we take the example of Jibra'il. Jibra'il sometimes would appear to the Prophet in human form. The appearance of Jibra'il may differ in Barzakh. May... So we know the Prophet ﷺ, he saw Jibra'il in his original form at least twice. So Israel may change his appearance depending on where he is or what part where where he's operating you know it's kind of like water sometimes water is liquid if the, if the temperature is high it's going to be liquid if the temperature is cold it's going to be solid it's going to be ice but it's still it's still water but its shape changes depending on the uh the conditions angels are similar Depending on the conditions, they, they'll take a form depending on what is the appropriate uh, condition. So Israel, it seems that this is perhaps his, his, natural, his, his natural original form. He may take a different appearance when he descends. You know, in the same way that you, when you have, if you have a cup of water on the top of a mountain, chances are it's going to be solid, it's going to be frozen. But if you bring that cup of water down, you know, at high altitudes, it's going to freeze. You bring it down, it becomes liquid. It changes its form. So Israel in those higher realms may have that massive image, that massive form. But if he descends to dunya, his, his, uh, his appearance may change accordingly. Now it we don't we don't have any prophet who went on a mi'raj of course not in the same way that our prophet did Isa alayhi salam is occupying one of the the heavens so in a sense Isa alayhi salam is experiencing a temporary mi'raj and he will descend when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for him to return to dunya. But what's, what's interesting is that when Isa alayhi salam was, when he ascended to the, to the heaven which he occupies, on, I, I don't remember which one I would have to check, I think it's the fourth heaven. Allah says, إِنِّي مُتَوَفِّيكَ وَرَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ that when he when Allah raised him up, some scholars say that he was when he was ascended from dunya and placed in the fourth heaven, 
he was made unconscious and he was then elevated. Before before taking him up, Allah says, Inni mutawafika. Sheikh al Sanad, who's one of the Maraj in, in Najaf, he says that he was he was made unconscious during this movement from dunya to the fourth heaven. But the Prophet was fully conscious during this process of ascension. There was no mutawafika wa rafi'uka. And this is because the, cap- the Prophet's capacity is greater than the capacity of, of Isa salam. That he had to put him in this state of unconsciousness, if you will, and then, and then have him travel. Because it would be too much for his soul to bear. That journey would be too much for him. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ, he has the spiritual capacity to go through this uh, ascension with full consciousness. This is a very complex uh, discussion, but if you look at the Quran, Allah says, "Inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya." Allah didn't just say, "I'm I'm ascend, I'm taking you up to the heaven." Allah says, I'm terminating your state. I'm putting you in a comatose state. And then when you arrive, you will regain consciousness. Whereas with Rasulullah, there is no, there is no need for him to be in this comatose state and, and take him up. He can experience mi'raj in a state of full consciousness. And it requires ex, ex, an extremely high level of spiritual endurance to go through that, to experience that while you're fully conscious.